So this session, we'll be talking about monitoring and maintaining DHS2 implementations over time. Health information systems are complex uh, systems that evolve and grow over time, and this requires ongoing maintenance. There will be information requirements that change. Scope of the implementations often grow with new health programs being added. There are new users that need training. Uh, there are existing users that require retraining. And there is IT equipment and infrastructure that has to be maintained and replaced over time. These kind of uh, foundational maintenance activities are often not prioritized when uh, there are made new plans for health information system strengthening. Uh, there is often limited funding. And the responsibility of these kind of maintenance tasks are often distributed across several units in the Ministry of Health or delegated to the health management information system, which often have limited resources to work and prioritize this kind of maintenance activities. The learning objective of this session is to identify what areas of DHS2 implementations that do require ongoing maintenance and to understand why it's important to plan and budget for these maintenance activities to keep a well-functioning DHIS2 system in place. The outline of the session is to first look at the capacity building and activities, maintenance activities related to capacity building. We'll then look at the infrastructure and equipment, then main, the metadata maintenance, as well as uh, regular auditing of the system. We'll start by looking at the capacity building component. And there are several things that makes it important to plan for ongoing capacity building activities uh, to maintain a good implementation of DHIS2. First of all, there is new stuff coming on board continuously within the health sector and among the users of DHIS2. And there is existing stuff that require refresher training. Over time, the type of information that is included in the DHIS2 platform changes. There will be new dashboard, new reporting forms, new case-based programs which means that knowledge of the system becomes outdated, uh, requiring refresher trainings for all users. This is in particular the case for the core team maintaining the DHIS2, as these also need to be able to follow up on new features, configure and implement them to make them available across the board. Because of this, it's important that countries have a funded capacity building plan that covers training both of the end users at the national, subnational, health facility and even community levels, as well as the core team of administrators of the system. In cases where there is no continuous capacity building, the end result is often that the core team of system administrators is designing building a system that is not working well, and that users at the subnational national level are not able to use the information that the system provides. So if there is no co continued capacity building plan, uh, this can result in inexperienced, poorly trained system administrators that build a system that is not fit for purpose. And it means that end users of the system who are supposed to use the information to improve their work within the health sector is not able to actually leverage the information that the platform provides. For the core team of system administrators, the primary way of building capacity is through DHIS2 academies and through various collaborations within the HISP network. This includes workshops on specific thematic areas, as well as specialized in-country training when required. For end users, there are a number of different modalities, dedicated training workshops, on-the-job supervision, Training and capacity building can be built into other routine activities, such as review meetings. We provide an online DHIS2 platform, which is freely available for users also within countries. And it's possible for countries to set up localized online courses to provide training. Finally, there is various job aids that can be developed, for example, videos, instruction manuals, etc. For end user training, the scale is often so big that it's necessary to have a cascading approach where you train a team of trainers who can then go and do the final end user training. Capacity building is discussed more in detail in the capacity building session of the course. So now we'll talk about the infrastructure and equipment. So DHS2 is a web-based platform. This means that there are essentially two 
equipment infrastructure components that needs to be in place. There needs to be a central server where the platform itself is hosted. And end users need to have devices with internet connectivity. The server and hosting costs and uh, work is sort of an ongoing running task and cost that increase over time as the system grows both in scope and in scale. For implementations that rely on physical uh, hardware that is self-hosted, there needs to be a plan to replace this equipment over time. For those relying on uh, cloud-based hosting, there is an ongoing monthly, typically, uh, hosting cost that needs to be budgeted for. In addition to the actual physical servers, there is software that needs to be maintained, kept up to date, uh, which in turn requires specialized staff who is capacitated to do this uh, work. In terms of end-user devices, the basic requirements is that they have some form of computer, tablet, phone, with internet connectivity. And this also has a running cost, both in terms of replacing these devices as they grow old or they break down, but also providing uh, internet subscriptions uh, or airtime. This is, again, a cost that often increases over time as DHS2 typically scales down towards reaching the lower level of users, increasing the number of devices, the number of internet subscriptions that are required. So a country may start targeting the district level users, but then as they are able to accommodate end users at the facility or even community levels, the number of devices needed will typically increase many fold. We'll now have a look at uh, metadata maintenance. Metadata in the context of the HIS2 refers uh, in essence to how the system is configured. So the metadata in the HIS2 is the reporting objects, such as the data sets or reporting forms. It's the health indicators and the way they are configured. It's the dashboards and visualizations that the end users see. So all of this is what we refer to as metadata within DHIS2. This metadata changes and expands over time. So when a new health program is included within the DHIS2 platform, or when there is changes to the reporting forms or the required analytics, or uh, even when a WHO metadata package is introduced into the system, there will be changes to the metadata as a consequence. Also, when the DHS2 evolves, there are new software updates with new features. The metadata often changes implicitly just by using a newer version of the system. The system itself will change the metadata to accommodate the new feature. Just to give an idea of the, the scale we're talking about here in the national DHIS2 implementations, provide some examples from a, a real DHIS2 um, national system. So in terms of data elements, the basic variables that is used for data collection, we may find 10, 15,000 data elements, several thousand indicators used for analytics, dozens and dozens of what we call categories, which is disaggregations into, for example, age and sex groups. and over a thousand public visualizations uh, referring to charts and maps. So this means that in a system such as this, every user of the system, as they're trying to find the relevant information that they need, they will have to sift through all these thousands and thousands of variables. This is often a result of a system where the metadata is not well managed, where there are duplications, where the sharing settings within the system is not used so that users only see the relevant metadata, etc. An important reason that this happens is that this kind of metadata maintenance is often deprioritized by the core team who has a lot of responsibilities uh, and typically are pressured into working on new content, new features, rather than uh, maintaining what is already there. As I touch upon, the, having a poorly organized metadata in the system is problematic for several reasons. It makes it difficult for end users to find and use the information that is in the system. It makes it difficult for the system administrators to manage and introduce changes. It can also lead to data quality program, uh, problems for several reasons, typically in cases where there is duplications of metadata and different users may enter data into similar but not the same uh, variables, for example. And it can also lead to more fundamental technical problems that will uh, make it difficult to upgrade DHIS2 to new software versions. 
to ensure good maintenance of metadata within DHS2 over time, it's necessary to have a well-trained core team of DHS2 administrators who manage the metadata. This team needs to have SOPs guiding how metadata changes are done over time. There needs to be regular reviews and assessments of the metadata. And last but not least, the core team needs to have enough time and resources to actually prioritize working on maintenance on a weekly, monthly basis. Finally, we'll talk about uh, auditing of the system to strengthen uh, maintenance over time. So assessments of the HIS2 and the health information system is often recommended before there are big activities uh, that are planned, before the initial implementation of the HIS2, before the HIS2 is used for case-based surveillance for the first time, etc. But it's important to also think of assessments and all this as something that is useful to do on a routine basis as part of the ongoing maintenance of the system. So in the global DHS2 uh, team, we have worked on several uh, different audit assessment tools that DHS2 implementers can use to assess their implementation and identify areas that need strengthening. Uh, we have what we call the maturity profile which is an assessment uh, that is meant to be done relatively quickly as a desk review to assess the overall state of the DHIS2 implementation, identifying strong areas and weak areas to help guide planning of strengthening activities. We have a security audit tool that can be used for assessing the system against key security measures, such as whether there is proper encryption, backups, staff responsible for security, etc. We have a metadata assessment, which assesses some of the configuration of DHIS2, identifying both areas where there are errors in the way the metadata is configured, as well as giving advice on areas where there is room for rationalizing the way the system is set up. For example, if there are duplications uh, of indicators, etc. Audits by independent government bodies, for example, an auditor general, can also be useful as tools in a way to strengthen the maintenance of the system as it requires the system to be well maintained and any changes to be documented. These routine assessments uh, can both be formal, for example, uh, as is done by the Auditor General, or they can be informal, done by the team itself on their own implementation. It's also possible to have external his groups uh, or consultants come in and do these assessments to have some uh, form of independence in the way they're done. So to summarize, we know that DHS2 implementations, along with the overall health information system, evolves and changes over time. The scale is typically growing, the scope is growing, the content of the system is changing, there is new functionality uh, and new users. To have a DHS2 implementation that is well-functioning and sustainable over time, it's critical to have a plan and a budget for the key activities related to uh, maintenance of the system. This includes capacity building, server and hosting, equipment and infrastructure, metadata maintenance, and having regular assessments and all this. These are areas that are often left out of plans and budgets for the HIS2 implementations and gets deprioritized over more exciting things, such as new, new implementations of a case-based systems or new applications. But overall, they're critical for a well-functioning HIS2.